Blue Ace of Paper, questions 1 to 6. Question 1. So basically we're given this graph and we've got to, we're asked to interpret the graph and answer the respective questions. So for starters we have in each uh, sort of diet we have a systolic and diastolic bar graph and each represents a uh, blood pressure decrease. So you'll notice that for each diet the um, systolic blood pressure decrease is always much greater than the diastolic blood pressure decrease. So we've got three diets here. Each of these are for three individual scenarios. So diet one is a fruit veggie diet for people with high normal blood pressure. Diet two is a combination diet for people with high normal blood pressure and diet three is a combination diet for moderately raised blood pressure. So it's important to know that the fruit veggie diet is included in the combination diet but the combination diet also involves a uh, reduction in dairy products with a lot of fat in them. So um, the combination diet is a fruit veggie diet and a fat reduced dairy product diet. So in effect we'd be we'd expect to see a greater effect on the blood pressure decrease from the combination diet than the fruit veggie diet um, just because it's uh, reducing more sources of potential blood pressure increasing foods. Uh, in addition, we have uh, two types of people. So diet one and diet two involve uh, high normal blood pressure people. So people with a systolic blood pressure of 130 and a diastolic blood pressure of 180. Um, whilst the diet three involves someone with a moderately raised blood pressure, i.e. Uh, someone with 150 systolic and 95 diastolic blood pressure. All right. So now that we sort of get uh, that, uh, let's try and ha answer question one. So which of the following is likely to be the best estimate of the systolic pressure of a high normal pre person on a combination diet? So the most important thing to do first is to identify the appropriate graph. So high normal person on a combination diet, that is that this diet, diet two. Um, so what you've got to do then is figure out uh, the systolic pressure so on on this diet so the systolic uh, blood pressure decrease is represented by this red bar graph so um, if you look at the graph you can read across and you'll see that it is equivalent to a blood pressure decrease of six uh, millimeters of mercury which means that we are going from our initial uh, initial bl systolic blood pressure which is 130 um, and we're decreasing that by six so we will res uh, at the end of the diet we will have a blood pressure of about 124 on average so in this case the correct answer uh, would be a because that is the closest number 224 millimeters of mercury Question two, of the following, systolic blood pressure is most likely to increase most for? And then we're given a series of people in different scenarios. So this is a classic sort of GAMSAT question where there's a little trick to it. And in this case, the trick is that it is a reversal sort of question. So um, the diets that we've been given in the STEM, the fruit and vegetable diet and the combination diet, what they'll do is they will decrease blood pressure. But in this case, we're asked for a scenario in which the blood pressure increases. So you sort of need to pick up on that little trick. Um, otherwise, you're just going to completely get this question wrong um, and basically understand it in the opposite way that it's intended. So we've got to look for a diet in, uh, sorry, a change in which we experience uh, a increase in systolic blood pressure and that immediately rules out uh, answers A and C. So A is mild hypertensive person on a normal diet change to a combination diet. So normal to combination, um, we would expect a decrease in systolic, systolic blood pressure. Um, and same with C, people with high normal blood pressure on a normal diet change to a combination diet. We'd expect them to have, see a decrease in systolic blood pressure just because we're taking away those foods which can potentially increase their blood pressure. Basically, yeah, they're going on that really healthy sort of diet. So um, we're left with B and D, and we're going to try and um, go try and figure out who would experience the greater increase in systolic blood pressure. So 
Um, there's a little pattern that sort of emerges if you look at this graph, uh, sorry, series of graphs. So in um, diet one and diet two, those are the same types of people. So those are the people with high normal blood pressure, i.e. a blood pressure of 130 on 80. Whilst diet three is a person with a uh, mild, moderately raised uh, blood pressure or slash mild hypertensive blood pressure, and that is 150 or 95. And you'll notice that um, this group, the uh, high normals, experience less of a systolic slash diastolic blood pressure decrease than the um, other group, the people with moderately raised blood pressure, the mild hypertensives. So basically any sort of diet or um, change that is experienced by these people, the moderately raised uh, blood pressure group, the one with the higher initial blood pressure, that any change experienced by um, these people will result in a more drastic systolic and diastolic blood pressure decrease. Um, so the sort of inverse is true. So um, if they're these sort of people, these mild hypertensives are going to experience a greater um, decrease, they will also conversely experience a greater increase. So therefore we can say that the um, mild hypertensive uh, group on a combination diet changing to a normal diet will experience the greatest increase in systolic blood pressure. So therefore the answer is B. Question three, which one of the following is likely to be the best estimate of the diastolic pressure of a mild hypertensive person on a fruit and vegetable diet? So it's important to understand the initial diastolic blood pressure firstly. Um, so if we have a look at the stem, we will see that the initial diastolic blood pressure is 95 millimeters of mercury. And that allows us to immediately rule out answers C and D. The reason for that is C and D indicate a increase in blood pressure. However, if we are going from a normal diet to a fruit and vegetable diet, we would expect to see a decrease in blood pressure. So immediately we can rule out uh, answers C and D because they represent a increase in blood pressure. So now we're left with answers A and B. They both indicate a decrease in blood pressure, however, to varying degrees. So let's try and figure out the degree to which we will experience a decrease in blood pressure if we go from a normal to a fruit diet in a mild hypertensive person. So if we take a look at the graphs again, there are two really important facts that we need to pull out of this graph. The first important fact is that a fruit and veggie uh, diet is less effective at decreasing blood pressure than the combination diet. Um, so we can sort of see that in the in these two diets, diet one and two, basically the fruit and veggie slash combination for my, uh, high normal people. And um, we can see that the fruit and veggie diet is less effective than the combination diet. So um, that's the first important fact. And the second important fact is to note that the diastolic blood pressure decrease for, for mild hypertensives uh, on a combination diet is six millimeters of mercury. So uh, from that, we can sort of infer what a person with a mild hypertensive um, blood pressure on a fruit and vegetable diet, what sort of diastolic blood pressure decrease they'd experience. Um, and we can sort of say that that blood pressure decrease will be less than six millimeters of mercury because the combination diet will decrease diastolic blood pressure in mild hypertensives by six. And uh, we know that the combination is more effective than the fruit. So therefore the fruit diet should be somewhere under six millimeters of mercury. Um, that means that the only possible answer is B because A um, is over uh, six millimeters of mercury in blood pressure decrease. Um, so that that's how you answer question three. The Correct answer is B. All right, question four. Of the following diastolic blood pressure is likely to increase most for a typical? Um, and then we're given a series of scenarios. We're involving mild hypertensive people and high normal blood pressure people and people going from uh, combination diets to fruit and vegetable diets and vice versa. Uh, this question is fairly similar to question two. So if you sort of understood the reasoning for that, this shouldn't be much of a problem. You can immediately rule out B and D because they involve a decrease in blood pressure going from fruit and vegetable to a combination diet. Um, so we're left with A and C. And as before, we know that those on a uh, mild hypertensive people will experience the greatest magnitude um, in, in increase of blood pressure. 
when going from a combination diet to a fruit and vegetable diet. Um, so, yep. Yeah, so, all in all, the correct answer is A for question four. So, question five to six in the Acer Blue Paper. So, question five. Uh, it's important to understand what's sort of going on. So I have a, I'll quickly summarize what's overall being explained in the stem. So what we've got usually is we've got this uh, artery like so and blood is flowing through in what's called a laminar fashion. So it's going through in these nice straight lines. So this is a very smooth sort of flow of blood and as such it doesn't really produce any sound. All right. What's going to happen, however, is if we increase the cuff pressure to a really high pressure, what we're going to do is we're really going to constrict down on your arm and it's going to completely close over or occlude those arteries in your arm. And that's sort of what's being shown here. So we've got our artery, it's being completely closed over and blood just can't get through that little uh, compression point. So as such, uh, we're going to experience, or sorry, we're going to be able to hear nothing because blood, which is what sort of makes the noise in this so whole scenario, can't get through and no sound is therefore produced. So the blood can't get through, no sound. However, what we can do is, what will happen is we slowly reduce this cuff pressure and what will happen is it'll eventually get to this stage where it's in between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. So the systolic pressure is usually about 120, whilst the diastolic is about 80. So say when we reduce it down to an arbitrary number in between, so like 100, what will happen is during diastole, well, uh, the blood still won't get through because the diastolic pressure is much less than the cuff pressure. So we'll get a similar situation to before, no sound being produced. However, once the heart enters systole, so the ventricles contract, sending blood shooting through the body, increasing the blood pressure by a lot. Uh, what will happen is the artery will briefly open. And what will happen after that is that blood will sort of spurt through. And this sort of spurting motion is a very turbulent sort of flow. It's not like before where everything's coming through in nice straight lines. There's sort of like eddies and it's going all over the shop and it's making a lot of noise as it goes through. So this this sort of noise will occur anytime these arteries will just sort of intermittently open and the blood sort of spurts through. So it starts at the, when the cuff pressure is lowered to the systolic pressure. So for in this instance, it'd be when the cuff pressure gets to 120, that's when we'd start hearing the noise as in the pulse. And that would be uh, so the first point, and then from there, we continue hearing that noise until we reach diastole. So that is our cuff pressure was reduced to the diastolic pressure. And we get this sort of situation happening where the cuff pressure is so low that it's not occluding the arteries at all, even in at its lowest blood pressure point uh, in diastole. And we get no sound occurring because the blood can just flow through unoccluded. So just to summarize, if the pressure in the artery is greater than the pressure in the cuff over the course of the entire cardiac cycle, there'll be no sound. So that is the cuff pressure is lower than diastolic pressure. Yep, described by this. If the pressure in the artery is lower than the pressure in the cuff over the course of the entire cardiac cycle, there'll be no sound, i.e. cuff pressure is greater than systolic pressure. So that's sort of what's occurring here. Um, sound is only generated by blood spurting, spurting through the narrowed artery due to cuff pressure. Um, the intermittent passage of blood through the artery will be turbulent, leading to sound being produced. So sound will only be produced between if the cuff is at or in between, sorry, systolic and diastolic pressure. So with that in mind, let's try and answer question five. The pulse sound disappears mainly because the A, force of ventricular contraction declines as cuff pressure declines. Um, so that is true that we are declining the cuff pressure but we didn't mention anything in the stem about declining the ventricular contraction pressure. So A doesn't look really that good. Uh, B, diastolic pressure declines below a certain level. Well, again, we're changing the cuff pressure in this scenario. We're just slowly lowering that cuff pressure. We're not really mucking around with the diastolic pressure. So I don't think B is the correct answer. 
Um, C, systolic pressure equals diastolic pressure. Uh, we mentioned again, nothing about systolic pressure equaling diastolic pressure. Um, there aren't a lot of so scenarios where that occurs, but one of them is, I guess, when you're dead. But uh, that's sort of not really relevant to this exact question. Uh, and D, arterial occlusion ceases altogether. Well, that is the correct answer because the pulse sound, that is the noise, it will disappear when when we our cuff pressure gets below that diastolic pressure and therefore the arterial occlusion ceases altogether. That is the blood can just flow straight through. So the that is the reason why the pulse sound disappears and therefore the answer for question five is D. Question six, suppose the cuff pressure was 140 for a typical mild hypertensive person on a normal diet. Uh, the pulse sound would. All right, so first off, we can immediately sort of rule out C and D because what we know is that the uh, the normal blood pressure for a mild hypertensive person is about 150 to 95. So 150 on 95. Um, and the cuff pressure in this instance is 140. So it's in between the systolic and diastolic pressure. Um, therefore, as the cuff pressure is in between the systolic and diastolic pressure, we will experience sound. So it's this scenario as before. So C and D are immediately wrong. Um, as for A and B, well, we can sort of figure out that since the blood pressure, so the cuff pressure is 140, well, that's quite high slash close to the systolic pressure. So most of the cycle, um, for most of the cycle, sorry, the cuff pressure is going to be greater than the blood pressure. So because of that, um, the scenario in which the cuff pressure is greater than the blood pressure is this one. And since this preoccupies most of the cycle, well, the most of the cycle will have no sound. So it's only really towards the um, beginning slash um, just immediately after systole where we experience the pulse sound. But for the most part, most of the cycle, we don't hear a lot. So B would be the correct answer. <laughs>